Thank you very much for hosting me. And uh, I was telling Octave bef to Octave before that so far all the talks have been uh, outstanding. So uh, it's a big responsibility. I do my best not to uh, embarrass myself. And um, so, um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a summary of three uh, joint papers. Um, one with Stefan Sur, one with Dan, and uh, a third one with uh, Victor Ginsburg and Bojack Gorel. And I spoke a few times about the first two, so today I maybe I'll try to spend a bit more time on the uh, uh, on the last project. And um, yeah, so oh. so the the. Uh, motivation for for this work comes from the uh, closed geodesics conjecture. So a closed geodesic um, for me is uh, is a periodic orbit of the geodesic flow. So a geodesic that closes up in a periodic way. So for instance, here we have a, a sphere of revolution, and I drew four uh, simple closed geodesics. And actually, if you flatten a little bit uh, the um, this sphere of revolution. Uh, most likely, these are the only close, simple closed geodesics that remain. Nevertheless, it's remarkable that there are always infinitely many more closed geodesics, which are more complicated because they wind around and self-intersect themselves. And uh, indeed, it's a, it's a long-standing open conjecture that um, every Riemannian manifold of dimension at least two has uh, infinitely many closed geodesics. And it's also known uh, that uh, this conjecture fails uh, for spheres, if you replace Riemannian by Finsler, and I will go back to the notion of Finsler uh, later on, to the precise notion of Finsler. So the conjecture in Finsler geometry becomes there are as many closed geodesics as something like the dimension of the manifold, or dimension plus or minus one. And so both uh, conjectures are widely open uh, for compact rank one symmetric spaces of high dimensions. And, um, and most notably for, for, for spheres, except uh, S2. And uh, uh, there hasn't been much progress on these um, two conjectures uh, recently, but there has been progress on a subconjecture, um, recent progress on subconjecture, which is uh, just the existence of two closed geodesics. And uh, surprisingly, this is completely open. Uh, for sufficiently high dimensional spheres, uh, say starting from S5, even in the, in the Riemannian case, although it's known for generic metrics and, uh, and in certain cases. Um, right, so this is the uh, motivation and what I'm going to talk about is actually a conjecture that's slightly harder than the subconjecture. And uh, I'm not gonna solve it in general. Um, so um, it's a conjecture involving uh, the notion of Zoll Riemannian manifolds, um, which are, so it's a classical notion, but let me redefine it anyway. And Alberto spoke about, about Zoll rep flows uh, last week, but in case certain people were not here, uh, let me remind it. So a closed Riemannian manifold is uh, Zoll when uh, all its geodesics are closed and uh, have the same length. And actually this condition of having the same length um, may be redundant, uh, at least if the, if, the if the manifold M is simply connected. It's actually a conjecture of Marcel Berger uh, that this condition is automatic once you ask that the all geodesics are closed. Uh, and it's a theorem now for, uh, for spheres of all dimensions except S3. Uh, it was proved uh, a couple of years ago by uh, Radeski and Wilkin beautiful paper. And uh, I would maybe mention this paper later on as well. Um, but so let me denote by sigma p the prime spectrum of the Riemannian manifold. So by spectrum, I mean uh, the length spectrum. And uh, the p here stands for prime, meaning that I consider the spectrum only of geodesics of, uh, that are not iterated. So for every closed geodesic, I consider its length. Usually in Riemannian geometry, when people say length spectrum, they consider for every geodesic, all the multiple lengths that corresponds to the iterations uh, of the given geodesic. 
of, of a given closed geodesic. Uh, so most basic example of Zoll uh, Riemannian manifold is the round sphere and all these quotients, CPN, HPN, and so on and so forth. In any dimension, so here I drew S2. And if you take it with, with around with curvature one, so the unit sphere, um, the prime spectrum is, uh, is uh, the single tone two pi. All right, so here's the conjecture that implies the subconjecture of before. It says that if the prime spectrum is a single tone, then the sphere is Zoll, then, then the manifold is Zoll. All geodesics are closed and they all have the same uh, uh, period. So this implies that there are always at least two closed geodesics. If you only had one, then the spectrum would be a singleton, but then every geodesic would be closed. And uh, so this conjecture was actually claimed by Lusternik in, uh, in, in a book in, 19, in the 1960s. And together with Stefan uh, Sur, we gave a, a formal proof of it a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. And actually, the statement is a, is a little bit stronger in dimension two. So we only proved it in dimension two, but um, dimension two is special and therefore uh, you, you have a more precise statement. Namely, it's enough to consider the simple spectrum, namely the set of lengths of closure geodesics that don't have self intersections before closing up. So the simple closure geodesics. Uh, so the theorem is if that spectrum is a singleton, then every geodesic is closed with the same length and doesn't have self intersections before closing up. It was already known, and it's actually not very hard to show that on S2, if all geodesics are closed, uh, none of them has self intersections. In higher dimension, this uh, not having self intersections is less relevant because it's not a somehow topological, topologically stable condition. But still, uh, oddly enough, there are no examples of Zoll uh, Riemannian manifold simply connected uh, such that some geodesic self intersections, uh, at least to my knowledge. All right, so this was the starting point. And then with Stefan Soar, we started. Uh, studying the higher dimensional situation. And we had a sort of first result in this direction, which is, uh, of course, very, which is still very, very far from, uh, from this two dimensional statement. But I will come back to that result uh, towards the end of the talk because uh, we actually improved it with uh, Victor Ginsburg and Bajar Gorel. And before talking about that, let me um, move to the main. Uh, category of the talk, which is uh, contact dynamics, rep dynamics. Uh, so let's generalize everything I said for the geodesic flow um, to general, more general rep flows. So in this talk, I'm going to denote uh, by Y a uh, contact manifold of dimension two n plus one, and by phi t it's rep flow. I think that most people in the audience are uh, symplectic and contact geometers, but uh, let me still re uh, remind very quickly these notions. So a contact manifold is an odd dimensional manifold. For me, it will always be closed. And it comes equipped with a one form lambda, such that so lambda wedge d lambda to the uh, largest exterior power is nowhere vanishing. And so associated to such a form, you have a distinguished vector field. It's called the red vector field, denoted by R. And it's uh, defined by these two equations here, lambda of r equal one and d lambda of r equal zero. And its flow is called the rep flow and it will be denoted by phi t. So one of the main uh, object of study in uh, contact ge geometry and specifically in contact dynamics uh, are the closed rep orbits. So the, the, the orbits of the rep flow that start at a given point c and after a certain time come back to c. And uh, for every such orbit, I'm going to denote by tau gamma its minimal period. And then uh, let me generalize the concept of uh, length spectrum that I gave before. So the, uh, I'm going to denote by sigma p of a contact manifold its prime action spectrum. So for every periodic red orbit, I keep its, uh, its minimal period. And a more common spectrum in contact geometry is just the ordinary action spectrum, which is usually denoted by sigma. 
And uh, it's basically the prime spectrum together with all the multiples of the elements in the prime spectrum. Basically, for every periodic orbit, we take all its period, not only its minimal one. All right, so an example of uh, contact manifold, maybe one of the easiest example. Uh, we have the unique cotangent bundles of uh, either a Finsler manifold, MF, or a Riemannian manifold, MG. Um, so the cotangent bundle of a manifold comes equipped uh, with a, a canonical one form. It's usually called the Liouville one form. Local coordinates, you would write it as a PDQ. And uh, it turns out that if you restrict uh, this one form to a uh, to a fiberwise convex hypersurface or a fiberwise star shaped hypersurface, this gives you uh, contact form. And uh, for the unique cotangent bundles in the convex case, uh, the red flow that it gives you is the geodesic flow. So, namely, the orbits of the red flow are the lift of the geodesics parametrized with unique speed uh, to the unique cotangent bundle. And so, uh, so the length of a unit speed closed geodesic, it's, uh, it's period. And therefore the uh, action spectrum of the contact manifold is the action spectrum of the Riemannian underlying Riemannian manifold. All right, so th these are all very uh, basic uh, definitions. And now let me introduce the notion of uh, Besson's all uh, red flow. Uh, Alberto already talked about uh, all red flows last week, but let me uh, recap everything anyway. And also let me generalize it to the, this notion of uh, what we call best red flows. Um, so again, the notation is the same as before. So contact manifold is called uh, best when every red orbit is periodic. Uh, and uh, uh, turns out that in, uh, in a general contact setting, it's uh, 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 it's relevant that we do not ask for the periods, for the minimal periods of all orbits to coincide. Indeed, there's a quite a subtle theorem from the 1970s of Watsley that says that if every web orbit is periodic, then the flow itself is periodic. There's a common period for all the, for all the web orbits. And uh, so it means that uh, if you, if you have a, if you're like in this picture, you have a closed web orbit that starts at X here we have a, a cross section and we have the same cross section above. So the orbit closes up, uh, the, the, the bottom and the top are identified. The nearby orbits may wind around uh, the original closed web orbit, but what's the theorem tells you that uh, they, they can only wind around an uniformly bounded amount of time. So this is the general situation that you have on a, for an, on, a, on a Besser contact manifold or a Besser red flow. So if you, if you further require the minimal period of every orbit uh, to be the same, uh, then the contact manifold is called Zoll. And um, so here are the pictures, just the, uh, this one down here, all the orbits are parallel uh, from a cross section to itself. And uh, well, uh, in the literature- uh, But uh, there's a question from Paolo. Ah, sorry. Ah, thanks. So, Paolo, yeah, so would you like yeah, I'm reading it. I'm reading it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, Marco. Um, ah, yes. Yes, it's true. Yes. Okay. Is it true that, I mean, I repeat from, uh, is it true that uh, a contact form is best if it only if it comes from the boost B1 construction of a symplectic orbit form? Yes, yes. The projection onto the orbit space is indeed, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's an S1 bundle over a symplectic core before. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? So there's a question from Vukash. Uh, well, I, I mean, you can design uh, examples with uh, with arbitrarily large common period. Of but course. Is it related to something like the volume or something like this? Uh, I don't think there's anything known. I, I don't think so. Okay, thanks. In land spaces. M more questions? 
What, so what, what did Felix say? Land spaces. Land spaces. <laughs> yeah, land spaces are examples of uh, best uh, contact manifolds that are not Zol. But what, what was your remark? Well, just to see what you said about the unboundedness of the period in both ah, sphere. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes. Uh, I get back to that in a second. Yes. Right. So let's get back to that right now. Not with lens spaces, but with ellipsoids, which are the uh, examples to keep in mind, maybe, of uh, Bessens all uh, manifolds. So an ellipsoid is just a sphere. Here I, I, I wrote down the three dimensional one. It's a sphere in C2 defined by this equation and depends on these two parameters. And uh, so on a convex hypersurface of CN that encloses the origin, there's a, a canonical uh, contact form, which is the one that I wrote here in complex coordinates. And then the red flow is just the flow that rotates the factors with angular speed one over A and one over B. So you see that there are always uh, two periodic orbits, one that corresponds to Z2 equals zero, and it's A periodic, and one that corresponds to Z1 equals zero, and it's B periodic. And furthermore, if uh, the B and A are rationally dependent, then every orbit is periodic, the common period, the minimum common multiple. Therefore, you can make it as big as you want compared to the minimum of, of, of A and B. And uh, the ellipsoid is all if and only if it's around the sphere, A is equal to B. All right. So, time. Oh. Um, so let's, uh, I mean, I'll focus on dimension three because uh, in three dimensional contact geometry, most of what's known for the geodesic flows uh, actually is known and even a bit more. Um, so uh, first of all, let me mention that three dimensional red flows thanks to a result of Taubes, um, always have uh, uh, at least one closed web orbits. Uh, and uh, and uh, here I'm quoting an amazing result of a couple of years ago uh, due to Dan and Michael Hutchings uh, that says that actually in dimension three, uh, the number of closed web orbits is always at least two. And uh, so, um, so this result is proved by means of uh, embedded contact homology. And it turned out that by pushing the techniques uh, of this theorem a little bit further, uh, one can actually generalize um, the spectral characterization of all two spheres uh, to generate three dimensional contact manifolds. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and the result becomes that uh, a uh, three-dimensional contact manifold is best, so all its uh, web orbits are closed, if and only if the action spectrum uh, that includes all the multiples of the orbits has rank one, uh, namely up to rescale your contact form, say all the periods of the web orbits are integers. And uh, as a, uh, so the, of course, uh, if, if uh, y is best, then this condition is verified that follows from Watson theorem. So the novelty here, the difficult implication is from right to left. And the spectrum determines the condition of being best. And uh, is it, oh, there's a question. Ah, okay, so uh, Christian, Christian Lang, I guess, is, uh, is uh, uh, mentioning a paper about um, uh, Paolo's question, what's in black or before it's, yeah, thanks, Christian. And um, yeah, so a direct corollary of uh, the statement is that uh, the prime spectrum of a, um, of a contact three-dimensional manifold is a singleton if and only if uh, the manifold is all. So all orbits are closed of the same period. And uh, so actually this theorem is, uh, is um, so strong that it implies a new uh, statement also uh, for geodesic flows, if you combine it with other uh, known results in the literature. So let me mention it because I, um, I, I like geodesic flows very much. So there are two classes of results. Uh, one for Finster, uh, for the general classes of Finster geodesic flows. So let me also take the occasion to define Finster precisely. So um, 
So a thin slug metric is just a, a function on a tangent bundle. So that gives you in every tangent space of your tangent bundle, in every tangent space of your manifold, uh, it gives you a Minkowski norm. It's like a norm, but uh, it's not symmetric. And, um, and uh, also when you study the dynamics of geodesic flows, it's good to ask some smoothness of the uh, unit sphere. So basically a Finsler, um, a Finsler metric is the following data. For every tangent space, you have a convex sphere that depends smoothly on the base point. Uh, it encloses uh, and it encloses uh, the origin, but it's not symmetric with respect to the origin. Um, so a corollary of, uh, of the theorem, uh, of my theorem with Dan, is that if the length spectrum of a Finsler manifold, and not the prime, just the, the spectrum together with multiply, the, together with the multiply covered closure geodesics, if this is rank one, this can happen uh, for a surface, uh, if and only if, uh, well, our theorem says that the geodesic flow is best, and then known results uh, on best uh, geodesic flows uh, say that the surface must be either S2 or RP2. So for, for, for Riemannian geodesic flows, this was a theorem of, uh, uh, I believe, Botts and Samuelson. And uh, for Finster uh, geodesic flows, it, it follows from a paper of uh, uh, Frauenfelder, uh, uh, Labrousse, and Schlenk. And, um, right, so, and in the Riemannian case, the results are even, uh, are even, uh, even stronger and uh, are as follows. So it's still for surfaces. Um, uh, assume that um, uh, your surface is orientable, then the length spectrum has rank one, if and only if uh, your, your, your surface is a sphere, and uh, then it's a best sphere thanks to our, uh, our contact theorem, but then best spheres, two spheres are always dissolved thanks to a theorem of Gromel and Grove. And uh, if M is non-orientable, then you get an, like the, an, an ultimate uh, result, which says, uh, which gives you a, which solves the, an inverse problem, geometric inverse problem completely. If the uh, length spectrum has rank one, uh, then the, the non-orientable surface must be RP2 and must be the, 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 the round RP2, the one with curvature one. So this is by combining our theorem with uh, Characterization the, the uniqueness of uh, uh, Bessé RP2, which has been proved by uh, uh, Price, I, I believe, uh, some 10 years ago. So, okay, so this is uh, the situation in dimension three. And uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not, not of course, but I'm not able to prove anything uh, this strong in higher dimensions. So let me maybe uh, just make, uh, uh, just summarize everything we said with. Uh, with, uh, with open open questions, uh, hard open questions in higher dimension. So uh, probably the most famous uh, open question in contact dynamics is the Weinstein conjecture, which here I phrased as a question, which is the, which is the existence of at least one closed web orbit in a closed uh, contact manifold. And then uh, assuming that the Weinstein conjecture holds, and so far in all instances which has been per in, in, in which uh, uh, the answer has been, if the question has been answered, the answer is yes. So if the Weinstein conjecture holds, um, are there always more than uh, one uh, periodic orbit? And uh, then you can push the question for, uh, even further and ask uh, whether uh, the prime spectrum that is a singleton would force the contact manifold to be dissolved or even harder, whether the spectrum to be uh, of rank one implies that the manifold is best. Uh, there's a question. Ah, but I thought that that was only uh, by perturbation near uh, uh, near the round uh, RP2. Oh, so, uh, sorry, maybe I should repeat the question. I'm back to saying that the uniqueness of the Riemannian metrics on RP2 also follow from the result of Pew from the 50s. Okay, I thought that Pew was only for uh, Riemannian metrics that are uh, close to the round one. Maybe I'm wrong. No, Pu is global, and then you just have to notice that okay. the, if it's all, then the, the volume 
and say it's all and all geodesics of say length one, then the the area is uniquely determined. Ah, okay, okay, it's easy. Okay, so it's a uh, so it's a uh, yeah. It's a uh, yeah, probably priced. Mm -hmm. I know that, but you can deduce it from proof. Okay, okay, thanks, Alberto. More questions on? Uh... So of course it's not very uh, it's not it's maybe not a good exercise to. Uh, uh, go around and phrase uh, conjectures which are uh, harder than the Weinstein conjecture. But it makes sense to study uh, these questions at least in the classes of manifolds for which the first two questions are answered. And uh, uh, among these manifolds, there are uh, in higher dimension, there are uh, uh, the convex spheres. So let me maybe uh, talk about them a little bit. And that would be the subject of my uh, uh, project with uh, Victor Ginsburg and Mujak Gorel. So um, let me first uh, uh, set the, the terminology and notation, which is still very standard. But, um, so whenever I say convex uh, contact sphere, I mean a odd dimensional uh, spheres with hypersurface in CM plus one. And uh, I like to take it that, enclose, that encloses the origin. This is not very important for the rep dynamics, but if you do that, then you can choose as contact form, uh, uh, this canonical contact form for hypersurfaces uh, that are convex or, or even star-shaped and enclose the origin, uh, which is the same contact form that I used before for the ellipsoid. Um, so for this class of contact manifolds, um, there are uh, so-called action selectors that were constructed by Eklan and Hofer in the 1980s. And these are um, the, somehow the precursors of uh, uh, of the of their uh, symplectic capacities, and uh, I will mention them later on. So these action selectors are sequences of numbers CK. It depends on of integer. Each one of them uh, is an action value, so it depends. Uh, it, it belongs to the spectrum of the of the contact manifold, and they're ordered. And uh, C1 is the is the system, namely the the shortest period among all the uh, all the closed rep orbits. And then these, uh, these numbers grow with K and uh, uh, they, they grow, uh, it's known that they grow linearly and there, there are actually difficult questions about the uh, asymptotics. Um, I mean, uh, uh, about uh, whether the limb soup of the, of the, and the limb inf of the, of the slope uh, of these values in K uh, coincide or not and what happens when they, um, yeah, it's an open question whether the limb soup and limb inf of these slopes cannot, uh, can, if there are example in which, examples in which they don't coincide. I'm not going to talk about that. So the theorem we have with uh, uh, Ginsburg and Gorel is the following. So we're not able to characterize uh, the best condition for convex contact spheres purely uh, with the knowledge of the spectrum. We need, we need uh, this marking given by the action selectors. And the theorem says that if CK is equal to CK plus N for some K, and N here, once again, is the half dimension of the contact distribution of my uh, convex spheres. So this happens if and only if um, the convex sphere is best. And actually, um, so the difficult implication was from left to right, but even from right to left, it's it's not completely obvious. At least it was not completely obvious to me. And um, I would mention it briefly later on, if I have time. And uh, a direct corollary of this, uh, and the fact that C1 is the system, is that uh, C1 is equal to Cm plus one, if and only if the contact, uh, the convex sphere is all. And uh, there's only one situation in, uh, in which uh, uh, the knowledge of the spectrum is enough to characterize the best in Zoll condition. And uh, before mentioning it, I, I should say that uh, a difficult open problem for this class of uh, uh, contact manifolds is whether they, uh, they always admit at least uh, n plus one uh, um, uh, closed rep orbits. It's known in dimension three. Uh, I mentioned it before already, even more is known in dimension three. Um, but it's, it's completely open in higher dimension. Uh, the best known result, I believe, is due to uh, Yiming Long and Zhu, 
and it's uh, integer part of n over two. It's maybe it's maybe been slightly improved, but um, but not in all dim dimensions. And um, right, so however, the conjecture was Marco. By Marco, what is the quantifier on n in your theorem? Ah, uh, n is is fixed. Is the half dimension of the contact distribution? Ah, okay. Thanks for asking. Yes. So, um, um, right, so the conjecture of whether convex contact spheres always admit n plus one, uh, n plus one uh, closed geodes uh, n plus one closed web orbits uh, was proved by Lazary and Eklund uh, in the 1980s in the class of for the class of convex spheres that are nearly round. Uh, more precisely for the class of com uh, convex spheres that are uh, delta pinched. So delta pinched means that if you take your convex spheres and you you, enclo uh, you enclose, you take the biggest round ball that's enclosed by your convex spheres and the smallest round ball that uh, encloses your convex spheres, uh, then the, the, your sphere is delta pinched if uh, uh, the quotient of the radii of the two spheres is bounded from above strictly by delta. And uh, uh, so if delta is uh, uh, at most square root of two, then you look at the action spectrum of your, uh, uh, of your convex sphere um, and you check whether there are closed web orbits with period between C1 and delta squared C1. So notice that delta squared is strictly less than two because twice C1 is always uh, an element of the spectrum. So this, is, uh, this condition cannot be relaxed, this bound on square root of two. So if there are no periods between C1 and delta square C1, uh, that can happen if and only if your pinched sphere is all. So this is the only case in which the spectrum alone is enough to characterize uh, the all condition. All right, so um, in the, I have like 15 more minutes and I would like to try to prove um, at least the part of the uh, of point one uh, that goes from left to right. So I'm going to prove that uh, CK equals CK plus one implies best. Um, so in order to prove this, let's first... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you, you actually have 30 more minutes. I, ah, I have 30 more minutes. Yeah, good, good. I was actually panicking a little bit because... <laughs> no panic necessary yet. Okay, very good. Then I can... Uh, okay, good. So let me prove, um, then maybe I will, uh, <laughs> I will also mention a little bit uh, uh, about the other implication. So let me prove once again, point one from left to right. So that CK is equal to CK plus N for some K, if and only if um, y, uh, y lambda is best. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned uh, when I stated this theorem, I said that point two is a corollary of point one, but I, I didn't justify that completely. Uh, it's maybe, uh, it's maybe acceptable, but uh, point one uh, is actually a bit more precise than this. Uh, when this happens, so this happens if and only if the manifold is best, but then we know that CK is a common period uh, for all the periodic uh, web orbits, possibly not the smallest common period. And we can also say something about the common Collitzender index at this period. It's something that depending on your favorite um, normalization for the Collitzender index, it's 2k plus a constant, where the constant depends on how you normalize uh, the Collitz index. Okay, so, so let's prove um, left to right implication in point one. For doing that, uh, let's apply a very, very classical trick from Hamiltonian dynamics. So we're studying the rep dynamics on the given contact uh, sphere. Namely, we're studying periodic orbits of any possible period. And uh, let's introduce this uh, Hamiltonian H on the old phase space, Cm plus one. That's the Hamiltonian that's uh, identically equal to one on the, on the sphere. And it's uh, homogeneous of degree A. And A is a constant that you can fix once for all between one and two, for instance, three over two. You can also take A equal to two, but then uh, the calligraphy of what I'm saying is a little bit different. I found it slightly easier to choose it between one and two, but 
in the original paper of Eklund and Hofer, uh, they consider the equal to. Um, okay, so, and now what happens is that, so you're basically foliating your phase space with energy hypersurfaces uh, of your H. And what happens is that given a top periodic orbit of the red flow on Y, this corresponds to a unique one periodic orbit of your Hamil associated Hamiltonian system that will lie in uh, some energy level and the energy H will depend on the period. So this is a usual trick in Hamiltonian dynamics to convert a problem with fixed energy and free period to a problem with fixed period and free energy. Okay, and then uh, let's, so this, so far you could do this on a star-shaped uh, hypersurface. Now let's employ uh, the convexity assumption on our hypersurface. Um, so let me consider the dual function to our H, dual in the sense of uh, convex analysis. So this is the definition. And uh, so uh, I'm doing that because there's a nice variational principle which is very easy to deal with uh, for the for studying uh, closed web orbits of convex uh, contact spheres. Uh, you introduce this action function, which is a bit different than the usual Hamiltonian action function from symplectic geometry. It's sometimes denoted by psi. It's defined on the free loop space. Uh, no, not free actually. It's defined on the loop space of CM plus one of those loops that have zero average. And you can take, so the zero down here means that the, the, if you average the loop, uh, you get the origin. And you can take the smooth loops, but later on I would like to take piecewise smooth loops. And actually the function is defined in, in on LB loops, uh, not even continuous. But you can think, uh, you can think of uh, piecewise infinity. It's just that I, I, there's no standard notation to write piecewise infinity. So the action function is the following. So every element in this loop space is the derivative of, an, of, a, of a periodic loop in CM plus one. Uh, so the periodic loop is gamma. So the points in the domain of psi are denote them by gamma dots. And the function is the following. It has two terms. The first term is the symplectic area of, uh, of your loop gamma. Uh, so it involves the uh, primitive of gamma dots, but it's a symplectic area. So it's independent of the, cho of the choice of primitive. So this is indeed well defined, and the second term is the is what replaces uh, in the symplectic action function the integral of the Hamiltonian along the orbit. Here you integrate minus the dual Hamiltonian, and instead of the orbit you take uh, uh, minus i gamma dot. So if gamma were an orbit, this would be the gradient of the Hamiltonian on gamma. Um, so the expression may look a little bit odd if you're not used to convex uh, rep dynamics. But what's important to retain is that um, this function provides uh, the variational principle that we need. Namely, so the origin is always a critical point with critical value zero. So it's not interesting, it's always there. The other critical points uh, are the gamma dots such that some, one of their primitive, and actually only one, uh, is a one periodic Hamiltonian orbit for H. And, uh, um, actually, the, the critical values are essentially uh, the periods of the rep orbits associated to this critical point. Uh, well, it's the period, at least, uh, if you apply a certain transformation f that depends on your a. So if you want, instead of psi, you can consider f minus 1 composed with psi. You have to restrict the domain, but then the critical values are exactly the periods of the rep orbits. Okay, so once again, the critical points are Hamiltonian periodic orbits of period one. They correspond to a unique tau periodic for a unique tau rep orbit. And the critical value is f of tau, where f is a monotone function. Okay, so this is the variation setup. So let me uh, keep it up there. And now um, we want to do a uh, more theory for this function. And uh, this is a function defined on a vector space that's, that has no topology, it's contractible. However, the function is S1 invariant. And uh, that's what Eka and Offer exploited for, uh, uh, for studying the, the, the periodic orbits problem. So namely, uh, the circle acts 
on this loop space as usual by translation. And uh, uh, if you go back to, uh, to the expression of Psi, you see that here you're integrating an autonomous dual Hamiltonian and this symplectic area is also autonomous. So the function is S1 invariant. And uh, now, as I said, the domain of, the, of this Clark action function is contractible, but the topology is non-trivial if you consider the S1 equivariants. So the S1 equivariant cohomology is uh, the cohomology of the classifying space of S1, which is CP infinity. So that's, uh, this is a ring generated by one element E. So E is the generator of H2. And all the other elements of this ring are the powers of E. And now the Eklanhofer uh, action selectors are defined as following. So uh, F of CK, where F was this transformation that transformed the crep period in the critical value, is the infimum uh, of the values of B, such that, so if you're considering the kth value, you take your, your class E to the power K minus one, and you require this to be non-zero on the sub-level set where your function is strictly less than B. You take the infimum over all B, over all these B, and by standard variational arguments, uh, it turns out that this is a critical value. And uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can actually apply uh, not only Morse theory, but lustig Schneiderman theory. And uh, if you apply it and you translate the outcome of lustig Schneiderman theory uh, back to your original problem of in rep dynamics, what you get is the following. If CK is equal to CK plus N, uh, let's call this common value C, um, then you take, uh, so CK is the mean max that you do with e to the K minus one. And CK plus N is the mean max that you obtain if you, do, uh, um, if you do the mean max with e to the K minus one plus N. So there's, a, there's an e to the N that transforms this mean max to this other mean max. And the Stagnick Schneerman theory tells you that when these two critical values coincide, and e to the n is non-trivial on every S1 invariant uh, neighborhood of the space of C periodic rep orbits on your contact manifold. And uh, so if you, if you notice now, I, I, before I consider the functional defined on the derivative of loops, and here I went to the primitive. So uh, my neighborhood lives in W1b, but you can take C infinity if you want, or rather piecewise infinity. Okay, so, so far this is, uh, uh, this is Eklanhofer construction and this is the Stagnischneerman theory, which is very classical. So now let's, um, uh, let's play a bit more with the uh, Stagnischneerman theory. Um, so I I'm writing again uh, the outcome of the Stagnischneerman theory. And uh, so with a bit of algebraic topology, you can actually translate this condition in another condition that does not involve S1 equivariant, S1 invariant neighborhoods. Somehow when you do constructions by hands, it's not always easy to work on neighborhoods that are S1 invariant. At least it's, it was not for me in this situation. Um, um, so, um, so this condition star up here implies that uh, for every sufficiently small neighborhood, uh, but not necessarily as one invariant neighborhood, W, of the space of C periodic rep orbits. Um, if you look at its cohomology in degree 2n plus 1, and this is the ordinary cohomology, not the S1 invariant, not the S1 equivariant, which you cannot consider because W could potentially not be S1 invariant. This is non zero, this cohomology group. So e to the n lives in S1 equivariant cohomology in degree 2n. And here you go to the ordinary cohomology, but in one plus degree. And the argument is, is, uh, is very simple. You have to do some diagram chasing uh, with the Gizin sequence. So you start uh, with your S1 invariant neighborhood U for which the condition star is verified. And you stick inside, you choose inside this, any neighborhood of your periodic orbits of uh, period C that is not necessarily S1 invariant. But then this will contain an even smaller neighborhood that is S1 invariant. And, uh, and um, now you write down the diagram that I, that I drew here. The vertical arrows are uh, the maps that you have in the Gizin sequence 
of the S1 equivariant uh, cohomology of U and U prime. And uh, turns out if you do a little bit, of, if you play a bit with a Gsin sequence, that E to the N is always in the image of this pi star. And then this implies that uh, since E to the N survives under the map uh, down here, this group up here should be uh, non-trivial. So this is very, very simple. And now, uh, so once you have this, then uh, all you are left to show is that uh, in order to prove our theorem that CK equals CK plus N implies best, you're left to show the, to show the following thing, uh, namely that if some rep orbits of Y is the contrapositive, some rep orbit of Y is not C periodic, so either some rep orbit is uh, as period different from C, minimal period, uh, sorry, other some rep orbit does not have period C as a period that is irrationally independent from C, for instance, or it's maybe, or there's maybe some orbit that it's not periodic at all. Um, and if this happens, you can find an arbitrarily small uh, open neighborhood of the space of uh, C periodic rep orbits that has trivial cohomology in degree H2M plus one. So we're left to prove uh, um, this statement. So let's build, uh, let's assume that some of the orbit doesn't have period C and let's build this neighborhood. So I rewrote the statement up here. And so there are several ways to, to, to prove this. One way that I like is to exploit the fact that the rep, um, rep flow, uh, the rep vector field is uh, so-called geodesible. Namely, uh, the rep orbits are always geodesics for a suitable Riemannian metric. It's enough, for instance, to take the Riemannian metric for which the rep vector field is norm identically equal to one, and it's orthogonal to the contact distribution. I mean, yeah, there are many geodesics on your manifold, but the rep orbits are among the geodesics. Okay, so now let's assume that some orbit is not C periodic. That means that the set of fixed points of phi C is not the old manifold Y. So if it's, if this is a compact set. If it's not the old manifold, you can take a, a, an open neighborhood of it, which is not the old manifold. And now let me build, um, let me build an embedding of this neighborhood into uh, our loop space, uh, into the space of uh, C periodic loops on Y. I'm gonna call the, the, this embedding uh, Yota. So the image of a point Z is gonna be Yota Z. So this embedding, you can build it as follows. You can maybe guess it. Uh, if you take a point Z that lies on a C periodic orbit, then Yota gives you back precisely the C periodic orbit itself. Now, if you take another point that it's nearby Z, uh, if it's on a periodic orbit, again, you do the same thing. If it's not on a C periodic orbit, after time C, the orbit uh, doesn't close up, but almost. So you take a point, uh, you take a point along the orbit of phi z at time t minus uh, at time c minus epsilon, and uh, now you just close uh, close this curve by taking the shortest geodesic for the adapted metric uh, joining these two points. So you see that if z prime happened to be uh, on a closed web orbit, this operation gave you back again the original closed web orbit. Okay, so this is a, this Yota built this way is indeed an embedding um, that, so the, the image of Yota built like this is an open finite dimensional submanifold of your loop space that contains in its interior as a submanifold uh, the C periodic rub orbits. And now you take uh, a tubular neighborhood in the loop space of this finite dimensional manifold. Tubular neighborhoods exist on the Banach manifolds. Uh, so this is just a, if you want a neighborhood that retracts on uh, on the image of Yota, and now the uh, co top cohomology. I shouldn't touch the screen. Sorry. Uh, now the cohomology of uh, um, of W, since W retracts on the image of Yota, is the same as the cohomology of Z. But Z is an open subset of a manifold of dimension two m plus one. Therefore, the two m plus one cohomology vanishes, and that's the end of the proof. All right, so this is what um, I wanted to explain, and I still have 12 minutes. So maybe before, um, 
maybe let me let me say a couple of things uh, on the other implication. Let's see if I can go back to, to it. Uh, I'm not able to, oh, doesn't matter. I, I say it. Uh, I say it from here. So the other implication that Bess implies that ck is equal to ck plus n. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna prove it. And maybe just in a few words, it follows from the fact that if you have, um, if you have a Bessie convex spheres, the Clark action functional is perfect in the sense of Morse theory. And in Morse theory, when you take a, you have a function, say you're say in a closed manifold, you have its minimum. When you go up, the level sets retracts to the minimum, but at some point uh, you reach another critical value and uh, you attach handles and you go on. And at some point it's possible that when you cross another critical value, you attach a handle that has the effect of canceling the previous end. So being perfect means roughly speaking that the handles never, never cancel out. So you always add topology going up. And uh, basically by doing that, you see that if you have a basic contact manifold, just by index reason, you must be perfect. And if you're, and if you're perfect, uh, but CK is different from CK plus N, there's too much uh, equivariant cohomology. Uh, so something goes wrong. So you have to have CK is equal to CK plus N. So this is not a proof, it's just to give a few keywords um, of the idea. All right, so. Now, what about, um, what about non-convex uh, hypersurfaces? So let's now consider Y, which is a restricted contact type hypersurface. Uh, of CM plus one. And uh, so uh, for instance, you can take uh, a star-shaped um, hypersurface and then encloses uh, some point in CM plus one. And here lambda is just any primitive of the uh, standard symplectic form of uh, CM plus one. So for these classes of manifolds, the Eklund offer uh, action selectors are not available, but there's a but there's a there's something which is much much better, which are the Eklanoffer capacities, uh, which are uh, a sequence of values that you associate either to y. So these are these are values that you can associate to say any say compact subsets uh, of uh, C n plus one. And uh, it turns out, but it's uh, it's not obvious that if you have a uh, contact type hypersurface of CM plus one, the capacity of the hypersurface is the same as the capacity of its filling, which is the region enclosed, compact region enclosed by the hypersurface. And there are action selectors, uh, namely there are elements of the action spectrum uh, of the contact manifold. So again, these are a sequence of, uh, um, of values. So more precisely, only C1 is a symplectic capacity in the precise sense. Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, the, 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 higher, the, the higher capacities, CK for K at least two, uh, are not normalized. So they're not, technically speaking, uh, ordinary symplectic capacities. They're monotone and they scale well, but, uh, but they're not normalized. All right, so, um, so our hope was to have the same theorem, at least point one, um, for general restricted contact type hypersurfaces, but we're not quite there yet. The best we can prove so far is that uh, if the action spectrum of a restricted contact type hypersurface is, is discrete, and this maybe with a bit of work, maybe one can get rid of this condition, but somehow uh, we didn't manage so far, but it, sh it should be possible. Um, then if CK is equal to CK plus N, for some k, uh, then uh, um, then the hypersurface is Bess, and C is a common period for its closed rev orbits. So we're not able to prove the surprisingly the converse of this statement. So we're not able to prove that Bess implies that two capacities must coincide. Although I I would tend to say that it should be true, but uh, it's it's harder. It's you cannot we cannot argue as we did in the convex case, because the indices in general restricted contact type hypersurfaces, the indices don't grow enough with iteration somehow, and they don't behave well with, 
with iteration, or at least they don't behave as well as in the convex case. And uh, the other thing I don't know is whether C1 is equal to Cn plus 1 implies a zone. Uh, there are examples in which uh, uh, you have a restricted contact type hypersurface, and C1 is not the system. It's not the minimal period among the closed rub orbits. So I don't know. All right, so this is all I can say about higher dimensional um, contact type hypersurfaces in CM plus one. And then the last, in the last seven minutes, I hope I'll be able, I have the time to uh, explain the case of geodesic flows, which is uh, somehow uh, analogous. We can get results which are analogous to the results for a uh, convex uh, contact spheres, but um, at least some implications are harder. One implication is equal, is the same as before, but the other implication was easy before, is now, is now, much, is now much harder. So let's take MG, which is a closed Riemannian manifold. Or, or, and so now I'm con I, I considered red flow in the unit tangent bundle, uh, which is the geodesic flow. So the variation principle for closed geodesic is just the usual, the one given by the usual uh, energy function E. So this is a functional defined on the space of smooth loops uh, in M, or uh, it's more common to take the W12 loops, but this is just a technicality, completely unimportant. Uh, again, for my arguments, I need to work with piecewise smooth things because of the picture I made before. So the energy is just the integral of the squared norm of the curve. And uh, it's well known, uh, it's the least action principle uh, that uh, the critical points of the energy are either the constants, which have energy zero, uh, or the closure geodesics, which have uh, positive energy. And the closure geodesics parameterize with constant speed, but not speed one, not necessarily speed one. So there are action selectors here too, which are much more classical than Eka and Offer's ones. Uh, they go back to uh, uh, at least Marx to Morse, but uh, since I'm from France, uh, I have to say Poincaré. Uh, and um, so they're defined as follows. So um, I'm going to identify the manifold M with a space of uh, um, constant loops in my manifold. And um, and I said before that uh, the constant loops are always critical points uh, of, uh, of my energy. Therefore, if I want to do more theory, I have to somehow uh, do everything relative to this constant. So the right group to consider is the cohomology of the loop space relative to the constants. And in my case, the S1 equivariant cohomology. This was first considered by Nancy Hingston uh, in her PhD thesis, and, uh, and then it's been widely used since, since Hingston's work. Um, so the action selectors um, um, go as follows. If you take a cohomology class or an S1 equivariant cohomology class, then you, uh, its uh, action selector is the infimum. I'd like the action selector to be length of geodesics. So it's the infimum of square root of B, uh, where B is such that uh, your cohomology class kappa is non-zero on the B sub-level set relative to the constants. So again, by variational methods, this gives you the, um, uh, so uh, B is a critical value of E that's positive. Therefore, square root of B is the length of uh, a closed geodesic. So, so far, everything worked for a general closed Riemannian manifold. And now let's be more specific. So I already said it before. So I, I, I'm going to, I'm interested in Zoll and, and Besse Riemannian manifolds. And uh, it's known since, since Bott and Samuelsons that such manifolds uh, are either compact grain quantum symmetric spaces or manifolds that have their own, the, the same uh, uh, cohomology ring uh, as them. So let me do, let me, let's do, uh, let's not uh, be technical here. So let's take M to be a simply connected compact grain quantum symmetric space, which means uh, one of these uh, manifolds, either SN or the complex projective space, I read it, uh, Cp n over two, so that n is still the dimension. Ah, there's a typo here. The third manifold should be Hp n over four, the quaternionic uh, projective space, or the Cayley plane, which is a more uh, exotic object, which is a 16th dimensional manifold. And uh, for some 
for some reason that I'm going to briefly mention, hopefully, I have to consider only among these manifolds the spin one. Actually, these manifolds are almost all spin except CP on n over 2, except CPN for n even. So let me consider any of these manifolds except the even dimensional CPN, complex even dimensional CPN. All right, so, um, so this, I only have two minutes, so maybe I will take a, just a couple of minutes uh, more, I'm sorry about that. Um, so it's known that if you take this all uh, metric, uh, the Morse theory is perfect for, this, uh, uh, for these manifolds. And therefore, the, uh, this cohomology ring, this one equivalent cohomology ring is completely known. It was computed by Nancy Hingston. And uh, it's known that there are always two generators, uh, which I denote by, uh, there are sequences of pairs of generators, which I denote by alpha m and beta m. So you should Im imagine them as follows. So if, uh, if you take the round, the round metric on these crosses, where all geodesics are closed, you take the manifolds of geodesics iterated n times, that's a critical manifold. Alpha m is the bottom class of, the, of its homology, and beta m is the top class of its homology. So they, they live in degree i m and i m plus 2 m minus 1. And i m, uh, it's, uh, we know what it is. There's a specific formula for it, but it's completely unessential for this talk. OK, so we have this sequence uh, of pairs of uh, cohomology classes. I rewrote them here. And now the theorem we have is the following. Uh, it's similar to the, the one we have for convex uh, hypersurfaces, but, no, but, but there are a few differences. So the theorem says the following conditions are equivalent. The mean maxes on alpha 1 and beta 1 are equal if and only if uh, the mean maxes are equal for all m among alpha m and beta m. And this happens if and only if the manifold is zol. So basically what we prove is that if c of alpha m is equal to c of beta m, uh, then the manifold is best. And then we use, uh, um, and then if this happens for, uh, for alpha one and beta one, we use a difficult result, uh, recent result of Radeski and Wilkin that says that if a Riemannian manifold is best, and there are not many of those, uh, there are on land, Riemannian length spaces, but conjecturally simply connected best Riemannian manifolds are resolved. So um, if you have a best uh, uh, Riemannian manifold, then the energy is perfect. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, once the energy is perfect, condition one implies uh, condition two, and implies also that, there are, that alpha, C of alpha one is really the, the system of the manifold. And uh, maybe just one last thing is that uh, um, if you now, uh, if you focus on the sphere, uh, for the sphere, the, what I mentioned before, the Berger conjecture is known. It was proved indeed by Radeski and Wilkin, except for n equal 3. And it was proved in dimension 2 by Gromov and Grove. It's known that the best sphere is always Zoll. So it's even more than uh, the fact that best, uh, best uh, Riemannian metrics are perfect in the sense of Morse theory. And then you can replace condition 1 by this condition prime. And uh, I think that this was everything I have to say, so one minute is over time. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. For Could I maybe stop the screen sharing? Um, so perhaps uh, we can ask the audience if, if uh, anybody has uh, questions, maybe uh, having the slides on will be uh, useful. So. Uh, questions? Uh, any more questions? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> Marco, in the, in the first part, you used, when you discussed Eklund Hofer capacities, you used the, 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 ver, uh, the, the work of Eklund and Hofer, and they are the same as the ECH, uh, sorry, as the S1 equivariant capacity of Hodgkin Good. So when you would use all their fluoromology set up, you may have more structure, and then you may try, you may be able to go a bit further. Yes, yes. Did you try that? I actually wanted to mention this and I, I, I forgot somehow, something I was not able to do so far, but I'm, I'm quite confident it, it should be true. 
Uh, so first of all, about what, I, what you said, as far as I knew, but I, I may be wrong, it's only known for the first capacity. Am I, am I wrong? Is it known for all of them? Uh, for co oh. Uh, yeah, so there's this paper of, oh. if I'm not wrong, there's a paper by Alberto and oh. uh, Jim so Kang, no and way, another paper wait, by Kairi, where they show that for, uh, yeah, for the, the first capacity we find in the, in the in the, for for convex hypersurfaces. Ah, oh, right, right, right. The, the, the the for convex, but not in this gen, not for arbitrary convex. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. For arbitrary convex, only for the first. Capacity. Yeah, yeah, I see. So, um, and uh, but but uh, so so everything I uh, I did with uh, Victor and uh, Bajak, we actually uh, we immediately started with considering a boundary of dual domains. And we wanted to use indeed the Schwann equivariant um, okay. uh, symplectic homology. The problem is that the Lustenglish schema theory it didn't it didn't go through completely. So basically, we are able to reprove everything if we add an assumption, which is a little bit ugly, in my opinion, to add. It was already ugly to add for us in the in the restricted contact type situation. It was already ugly to add the assumption that the spectrum is discrete. But probably we can get rid of them. But for general boundaries of Liouville domains, we have to ask for the spectrum, for the, for the dynamics to be more spot. Namely, if the Reb orbits are organized in nice closed manifolds, even open manifold, and Reb, say, in nice closed manifolds, then, um, then everything, everything we did in the classical setting goes through using this one equivariant syntactic homology. But somehow getting rid of that, uh, yeah, getting rid of that uh, of the condition. Uh, the beginning I thought it was a matter of one afternoon, and then after many many afternoons, it was uh, maybe it was a matter of a few weeks. And after a few, uh, after a few weeks, so then Bajak and Victor had more important things to do than listening to me, and and then we dropped it. <laughs> but then no, we didn't drop it. We we still. Had, it's it's doable. It's, uh, it's it should be doable, one day. <laughs> so in a way, you say it's really worthwhile to go back to the Ekanov set, setting because there you don't have to perturb and everything is immediately defined and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a, mm -hmm. that's essentially the advantage of working with classical theory. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. never perturb. Mm -hmm. You you work on. Uh, this is something that uh, the people more familiar with closure these literature are. Uh, are used to that you never perturb you always uh you work on uh your degenerate things uh on uh, directly yeah thanks <laughs> yeah thanks for asking maybe i have a question mm -hmm. uh, so you had this uh corollary saying that if uh, length spectrum lies in the arithmetic progression, so then on a surface, so then the surface is zone. Yeah. Right, so now assume that you have like something which cannot be uh, solved by uh, topological reasons, like torus or something. Uh -huh. So yeah. can you quantify the statement and say that then the spectrum is far in some sense from uh, arithmetic progression? Uh, uh, so let's see, let's see. I can tell you how the proof goes so may, and in doing that maybe I answer. So basically what, what we have in the paper with Dan is that uh, we have a sequence of action selectors, but these times they are the capacities coming from ECH. And it's known that they grow like square root of K. So we have a sequence of CK. And uh, what we prove is that if CK is equal to CK plus one, then you must be best. And uh, yeah, so I think that, you, that the answer to your, your question is that it doesn't follow from, that it doesn't follow from our arguments. And, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting, but I, I would get, I would guess it's a very difficult question. 
I, I thought about trying to understand, for example, the possible ranks of the, the spectrum in the contact case. I mean, so Marco's calling this the rank one condition. And then if you have like an irrational ellipsoid, you know, you, you could have, the spectrum could have rank two. You know, you could have like an ellipsoid E1 pi. And, and so the spectrum would be like, you know, um, uh, and then I wondered, maybe the spectrum should either have rank one, two, or infinity, so, be, because there are these two or infinity results in, um, in, in dimension three. But I, I haven't been able to prove anything. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. And I thought maybe the rank two case one might be able to give some kind of characterization of, of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> But I wasn't able to prove anything there. I mean, I haven't been able to prove anything there yet either. So I don't know. Thanks. Are there uh, any more questions? Well, M Marco, what what about recognition questions? Um, Ah. You know, like if you wanted to actually learn what the contact form is from, you know. Uh, yes, I should have it. mentioned that. Yeah. Um, um, so in dimension three, my in our paper, we 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 also showed that uh, once you know that the the spectrum has rank one, then you can actually reconstruct the contact form. In high dimension. Uh, yeah, in higher dimension. I don't even know if there's a unique Zoll, uh, say, once you fix the topology of the contact manifold, I don't even know if uh, there's a unique Zoll contact form. Maybe somebody knows in the audience. Um, but yeah, the, the simple argument for dimension three doesn't, doesn't go through in higher dimension. Hmm. Yeah. But, uh, I, I guess the classification comes from the fact that for a surface you have a unique symplectic structure for the portions. And you don't have anything <laughs> like that in higher dimensions, so I don't see how. Yeah, yes, yeah, the, yeah. I, I don't think you could have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, unless, yeah, course, yeah. unless you can classify symplectic structures on manifold, which would, of course, <laughs> be a nice result also. <laughs> yes, but then you. Don't even, you don't even bother about talking about Zolt stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I actually realized also while doing this that I don't have many examples. <laughs> uh, when I think about these problems, I, I only think about ellipsoids and round spheres, essentially. Yeah. And you, what about the, the original question you posed of finding two rabe orbits your your work with the shock and victor do you have any applications to you know do you expect any applications ah, so for convex uh, in the convex settings uh, uh, there are much stronger results that right. are known so there right. the difficult problem is to find n plus one right but uh no basically uh, it's a bit, a bit what i mentioned before all this work is, uh, can start only in those situations where you're able to find several periodic orbits. Otherwise, it's, uh, I don't know where to start. Uh, everything I explained today does not give any clue uh, on how to fi find, say, a second closed geodesic kind of higher dimensional sphere. It's, so it's for, not... for restricted contact type, what? what? Ah, uh, ah, right. So the uh, two is, is uh, um let's see so uh, uh, i'm sure that claude knows this or or, or helmut so what's known about the multiplicity of closed web orbits in the restricted contact type case in r2n is it known that there are always at least two no in in, 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 in oh, no, no no in higher dimension it's known in a non-degenerate case. 
Ah, yes, sorry. It's yes, the, the, the long. Uh, yeah, the long. Yeah. Well, by long and quote. Yes. yes, yes. I didn't. Oh, okay, okay. But but uh, there are also there are also these uh, resonance results. Let's say that when you. Uh, uh, wait, am I, am I? Yeah, no, sorry, I, I should check in the literature. But okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a result of long and co-authors, but it only works when you perturb the bits. Mm -hmm. For geodesic flows, I think that the most recent results are a bit better than this. Uh, it's known, for instance, that, that spheres uh, that are bumpy um, always have two closed geodesics. Of course, if you start with any given sphere, you can wiggle it a little bit, it becomes bumpy. But bumpy, but, uh, bumpy, bumpy means infinitely many, I think, no? We, for bumpy matrix. Wasn't that the gromal mayer theorem? No, gromal mayer is, uh, is uh, when you have a growth in, uh, that's, that's for spheres, that, that's for manifolds that are not uh, spheres indeed, that have a uh, growth in the loop space uh, homology. Ah. For bumpy, it's reality bumpy. Reality machen for bump. Ah, okay. So, uh, wait, wait, it's not, uh, we're talking about two different things. So, what uh, Claude is saying is that if you start with, if you start with a given Riemannian manifold, no matter what topology you have, by wiggling a little bit the, the, um, the Riemannian metric, you have infinitely many closure physics. This was proved by Nancy Hingston, and then reproved by Rademacher with different techniques. And then, uh, but then the, the recent results are, are a bit different. They say that any given bumpy metric, you don't have to wiggle the, the given bumpy metric. You just have to know oh, it. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. it has at least two. Mm -hmm. It's um, a different result. Well, uh, it's not clear how different they are because uh, you, uh, yeah, of course. you can look at the set of wiggled objects and maybe that's, uh, that's the yeah. set of bumpy. Yes, yes, maybe. So, yeah, conjecturally, there should be infinitely many. It's a bit, um, yeah. But uh, as uh, I don't know if Alberto is still there, maybe he left. But as Alberto pointed out to me once, there are actually chances that this, not chances, but it's 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 not impossible that the closure physics conjecture is maybe not true, because in the known cases. Which there are infinitely many closure physics, the reasons are always different. There's no single reason that encompasses all the cases. So it's um, it's maybe I don't remember telling you this, but okay. <laughs> yes, it was after a few beers. Uh, after a few beers, the okay, European that's Championship. That's more believable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> maybe I should have mentioned your name. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I do you want to do cultural appropriation? I have a suggestion. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, we uh, wrap up the, 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 the formal question uh, session and pass to informal question session. <laughs> and uh, so let's thank Marco again for, for, Thanks a lot. for, for the patience.